This video is sponsored by Hook Theory. By overwhelmingly popular demand, this video is my analysis of Don't Lose Your Head from Six the Musical, a song that is all about power and how the world responds when Anne Boleyn gets power. And I think there's a reason y'all chose it so overwhelmingly, but more on that later. The theme of power is embedded into the title and chorus of the song itself, Don't Lose Your Head, which is at least a quadruple entendre. It's a reference to the fact that she was beheaded. It's an idiomatic phrase meaning don't lose your cool or your calm. Head is also a naughty term that I will gloss over to avoid being demonetized. But head also can refer to a position of power and the Queen of England is literally known as the head of state. The monarch's main role as head of state the head of state. My head of state. Who I found most impressive. Queen of our head of state. Was Queen Elizabeth II. You're the sovereign. The head of state. You don't get dictated to. And by the end of the song, Anne Boleyn fails. She loses all of these things. She is no longer the head of state, or has her head for that matter. But perhaps most importantly, she loses her cool, or rather she is perceived to lose her cool. And in the world of power, perception? It's like life or death. So how would a composer musically represent this concept of power? Well, for that, you can look to one of Toby Marlowe and Lucy Moss's Queenspirations for Anne Boleyn. Avril Lavigne. Avril Lavigne's music is indeed very powerful, but one reason why is that it uses a common rock technique known as power chords. These power chords are actually just two notes. The root note of the chord and the fifth note above that. That's why a lot of Avril's sheet music features the notation of chord letter and the number five, indicating it's just the root and the fifth. The song is structured with three verses, which are each followed by a chorus. And these open fifth power chords occur all throughout the verses of Don't Lose Your Head. But then I met the king, and soon my daddy said, You should try and get ahead. Again, here are the root notes. And here are the fifths, and here it is combined. But chords usually have at least three notes. So wouldn't this two note chord sound a bit empty? Well, the open fifth is actually a pretty traditional way of expressing power. The open fifth, also known as the perfect fifth, lends itself to the feeling of an epic space, allowing epic melodies the room to dazzle, which is why it's often used in drones from Indian music, it's also a pretty well-known fact that John Williams uses the perfect fifth as a starting point for most of his heroic themes, as it helps to convey the power of Superman, the powers of E.T., the epic battle for power in space, or in Jurassic Park, the perfect fifth symbolizes the power of dinosaurs, which is really a stand-in for the power of nature itself, which is maybe why it gets two perfect fifths back to back. And if you're like, wait, there's a lot more to it than that with Pythagoras and ratios. Yes, I know. My award-winning undergraduate honors thesis was all about the perfect fifth, which I might turn into a future video, so stay tuned. Another reason power chords sound so epic is that helping to fill in the open two note chords on the guitar is distortion, which fills the chord to make it seem louder and fuller than it otherwise would. This distorted power chord sound is a fundamental sound in all rock music, from punk to metal to grunge. And even though you can distort a normal three note triad chord as well, what tends to happen is that the distortion sounds muddy and paradoxically less powerful. But all of this is to say, in Don't Lose Your Head, Anne Boleyn's verses are accompanied by power chords, which are underscoring lyrics about her life of royal intrigue, which is kind of perfect because you might say that living in proximity to the monarchy creates a very distorted view of the world. But when we get to the chorus, suddenly we don't get power chords anymore. Sorry, not sorry about what I said. I'm just trying to have some fun. 
no, these are normal chords with more than just two notes. Moss and Marlowe even draw attention to the fact that the chorus doesn't use two note power chords anymore by making Anne sing the outline of a three note chord. L O L, say oh well. And this is because the chorus is not about her rise to power anymore, but about her trying to hold on to some part of her normal life. Sorry Not Sorry means that she's aware of how she may come across to people, but also doesn't really care. In fact, this is not just a reference to the modern day catchphrase, but apparently was based on her real life motto. According to Eric Ives' book, The Life and Death of Anne Boleyn, in 1530, Anne briefly adopted this motto, which translates to, let them grumble, that is how it is going to be. I have a new motto, that's how it's going to be. Let them grumble. The motto was apparently Anne's response to protest against King Henry VIII's elevation of Anne over Queen Catherine of Aragon. In other words, Anne knew that she wasn't liked, but she also knew she wasn't going to change. And so instead she says, don't get mad at me for trying to have some fun. In fact, Anne Boleyn's other most well-known motto was the most happy. Then like my family motto, I am the most happy which you can see on a medal commemorating her from 1534. So this line about trying to have some fun is less about the attitude of someone trying to navigate the tricky world of politics, politics not my thing. and more about the sassy way that Anne learns to cope and push back on the demands of the world. And for all these reasons, this section doesn't sound like Avril Lavigne anymore, but more like Anne Boleyn's other queenspiration, Lily Allen. One of the things Lily Allen is known for is her eclectic sound palette. Have you got any kind of like sort of punky electronica kind of grime, kind of maybe like more broken beats, like kind of dubby broken beats, but a little bit kind of soulful? Do you know what I mean? Which manifests itself in her music through the playful, somewhat whimsical use of old vintage record samples. <laughs> In a similar way, the chorus of Don't Lose Your Head references an older style of classical pluck string playing known as pizzicato strings. And just as Lily Allen's vintage samples help to situate her in an idealized, acoustic, authentic past, so too does Don't Lose Your Head's pizzicato strings represent Anne's idealized, acoustic, authentic identity. That's why those pizzicato strings are played without distortion, to represent Anne's unfiltered internal self. And the pizzicato strings are also in a higher register th than the low, heavy power chords, showing her inner light and carefree side, as opposed to her external ambitious side in the verses. For now, these two sound worlds, and by extension, these two selves of Anne Boleyn, are separate. And for the first two verses and choruses, that seems to work out okay, until the third chorus, when the walls between her two selves goes away, and her two selves merge. Well, how do we get to that third chorus? In the first verse, Anne becomes a lady-in-waiting for the queen. In the second verse, Anne insists to Henry VIII that she won't sleep with him until they're married. And in the third verse, Henry VIII, wanting to sleep with Anne, does the unthinkable and gets rid of the Catholic Church in order to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marries Anne. Basically, up to this point, we are charting the brilliant rise to the top of Anne Boleyn, the only problem is not all the barriers have been removed, have they? See, even though Anne has progressed, at the same time, the world around her has not progressed. Sure, she can take down all these powerful figures, but it's only because she was favored by the king. But when Anne calls the king out on his cheating and gives him a taste of his own medicine, well, now she's upsetting the rigid order of society and must be punished. And it is in this moment, facing possible death, that she sings her chorus, her motto, once again. Fun. 
but this time not using the light and carefree pizzicato strings, but the full power of her power chords. Combining her intimate pizzicato self, which is all about her wanting to be loved for who she is, with her esteem-driven power chord self, which is all about freedom and yes, power. In other words, we're hearing her musically self-actualized here, with her previous two selves combining so she can achieve her full potential. It is at the height of Anne's powerful power chord defiance that King Henry VIII believes Anne has lost her head, gone mad even possibly accusing her of witchcraft. I made this marriage, seduced by witchcraft. You witch. No, my lord. You cursed, evil witch. It may be that he goes further and believes that his wife is a witch. Which shows up in the lyrics of Don't Lose Your Head as well. You damn it, witch. Mate, just shut up. And for that, she will need to lose her head. So if Anne is such a tragic story, why does it resonate so much today? Well, I think it's because she flew in the face of the social order and took it on. In fact, there is a long tradition of female heroines in opera who are exactly like this. They defy the authorities around them, and for that, they must be punished with death. And yet it's Carmen's melodies that are the catchiest. <laughs> It's Lucia's virtuosic bird-like aria after killing her husband to get out of an arranged marriage that we look forward to hearing. In the Magic Flute, it's the famous aria where the Queen of the Night orders her daughter to assassinate her rival in an outburst of rage. Hell, the main event of some of these operas, like Lucia de Lammermoor, is what's known as a mad scene. The whole point of these operas is to watch women losing their head. In other words, losing control, which often meant that composers would write their most adventurous and star-making arias for these moments. And these scenes are so beloved by opera fans that they're even packaged together as mad scenes by record labels. In fact, the Lucia de Lammermoor mad scene aria is so fantastic, it's even sung by an alien in the fifth element. But how does that connect to Anne Boleyn? Hi, I'm Margaret Hall. I'm a musical theater historian and an all-time fan of Six. Six is not the first time Anne Boleyn has been depicted on stage. Give it a little Google. Well, I did, and sure enough, the composer of Lucia de Lammermoor, Donizetti, actually wrote an Anne Boleyn opera in which Anne has a mad scene. You can even see the Anne Boleyn mad scene advertised on some of those album covers. So in a way, I think the fascination with Don't Lose Your Head is a nod back to this tradition, when characters like Anne Boleyn were the closest depictions of what it looked like for a woman to stand up to the patriarchal order. The Anne Boleyn that we know in pop culture is much more an idea of what men find terrifying in a woman. A woman who is in control of her sexuality, a woman who knows what she wants and is going to get it, and a woman who is ambitious and knows how to maneuver herself in society. That is the pop culture archetype of Anne Boleyn, but that is not necessarily the actual historical woman. And the only reason the story is deemed safe is that, like all opera heroines, she died for it. After all, it's a well-known trope that, in operas, most of the time, the heroines die. Catherine Clément even wrote a book about this called opera or the undoing of women. In it, she writes this about Carmen, but it might as well be about Anne Boleyn and Don't Lose Your Head as well. She is the very pure, very free Carmen, my best friend, my favorite. She is the image, foreseen and doomed, of a woman who refuses masculine yokes and who must pay for it with her life. The Anne Boleyn that we see in Six the Musical has a lot more in common with the pop culture idea of Anne Boleyn than the actual historical person that was Anne Boleyn. The primary source that most pop culture depictions of Anne Boleyn are pulling from is from the depictions of these men who were threatened in terms of power by Anne. Anne, as we know in a historical basis, was not this power-hungry social climber like she is often depicted, nor was she this ravenously sexual being as far as we know. At the end of the day, Six the Musical is a musical about the six women in the nursery rhyme. Divorced, beheaded, and died. 
to force Behead to survive. They're archetypes, they're ideas of who these women are as has been passed down in pop culture. In fact, one of the best lines in the show comes when Anne Boleyn intellectually explains all of this to the other queens. Since the only thing we have in common is our husband, grouping us is an inherently comparative act, and as such, unnecessarily elevates a historical approach ingrained in patriarchal structures. I read. This serious line may seem to break character for Anne Boleyn, but it's actually a nod to who she was in real life, right down to the fact that she read a lot. She was a quite religiously devout, big reader. She was a remarkably smart woman, incredibly studious. The idea of this vapid party girl, that is what they're playing with in Six, not necessarily the historical truth of Anne Boleyn. See, because Anne Boleyn in Six is not so much about who she was historically, but is about challenging the structure she and the other queens have been trapped in through popular culture. And so what better way to demonstrate that limiting social structure than using the structure of her own song, an anthem to being unapologetically free and powerful, only to reach the full potential of that freedom and power and still be punished for it. But Anne Boleyn's message in Don't Lose Your Head isn't to keep your head down, but rather to hold your head up high and make the world catch up to you. Because as she reminds us in the song, The rules were so outdated. Thanks for watching. What song from Six should I tackle next? Let me know in the comments. And please go check out this video's sponsor, Hook Theory, an educational platform designed to make music theory accessible and practical for everyone. It features tons of resources powered by their database of over 40,000 chord and melody analyses for popular songs you know and love. You can see that it graphically shows you the melody, the chords underneath, a grid to visually see the rhythm, and a keyboard which will illustrate how to play the melody or the chords note by note for yourself. And luckily for me, Hook Theory is today's sponsor, so I am promoting them in the best way I know how, by showing you how I use their website and how you can too. Additionally, they also offer the Hook Theory Skills Bundle, which includes the training game Chord Crush and Hook Pad, a songwriting sketch pad with a built-in music theory engine that makes smart suggestions in real time, so you can always find the next best note or chord for your song. Hook Theory is great whether you're a seasoned musician or a beginner Beginner. And if, even if all of this still looks unapproachable, Hook Theory has you covered with its books feature that teaches you music theory lessons from basic to more advanced concepts. If you go to hooktheory.com slash Howard Ho, you can enjoy 20% off the Hook Theory Skills Bundle and your first year of Chord Crush Premium at the link in the description. Again, go to hooktheory.com slash Howard Ho for 20% off and you'll be helping out my channel as well. I'd like to also thank my patrons on Patreon, including my newest patrons, David Bankoff and Kelvin Cow. Subscribe for more musical analyses, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.